Well, I have a question for you. Several, actually. If Sheriff Donald Smith walked through that door right now and said, all right, all you have to pack up your stuff, you got 10 minutes to get out, or you're going to jail. And he had enough deputies and troopers and military to, to actually enforce that. What would you do? Would you, would you be calm and pray for protection and pack up your Bible and, okay, we'll see you later. Or would you stand up in defiance and fight back? Now, many of you know Sheriff Smith and know that that's not likely to happen under his watch. However, what if it were a law from the state level or the federal level? What would you do? What if worshiping God was illegal? Seems extreme, sure. What if your employment, what if the very way you make a living was jeopardized by your faith? What if, and I know some of you have faced this before and many of you probably will, what if you run into a person who denies the very existence of God, who denies the birth, the life, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection, the very thing that we hinge our faith on What if that's denied in your presence? What do you do? All these questions lead to, and if you're taking notes, the title of my sermon is, Your Faith Dead or Alive? Uh, About, I don't know, 12, 16 months ago, in the midst of my pastoral training studies, in the midst of work, in the midst of my beautiful wife and I leading crew, I felt this prompting to read through the book of Acts. Uh, I was going to read one chapter a day, and study it and, and, and pray over it. And I made it all the way to the end of chapter 5. Um, because what happened at the end of chapter 5 really just stopped me in my tracks. It, I, I mean, my, my reading came to a screeching halt, and I spent literally the next several months praying over the last half of, of Acts 5. Um, and I started taking notes and listening to what I feel God was saying, and Next thing you know, I realized I'm writing a sermon. And so I prayed God, you know, hey, I feel like I've got the sermon and I'll have it ready for whenever you're, you call me to do this. And a couple weeks ago, Pastor Josh said, hey, I need you to preach on the 11th. I said, okay, now's the time. So thanks, Pastor Josh. <laughs> All right, so um, like I said, we're going to be in Acts chapter 5. Um, I'm going to start uh, at verse 17, but we're not going to read all of them. Um, But let me set the stage. So Peter and the apostles, they had been preaching and teaching. They had been healing in Jesus' name all over Jerusalem. They were teaching in the temples regularly. And see, the high priest and his officials who were Sadducees, they were very jealous. You see, they were supposed to be the teachers and the knowers of, of the law. They were the ones that the people were supposed to be paying attention to. So out of jealousy, again, the apostles were arrested, and they were thrown into a public jail. And that's important to note because while these, while the apostles were uh, preaching and all this in the temple, many people, men and women, were coming to believe. And so when the apostles were thrown into a public jail, it was to make an example out of them. It was the, the, the high council wanted uh, the new believers to understand that, hey, if you go out spreading these rumors, you're going to be treated in the same way these guys are. Um, but God had a different plan. He said, nope. And he sent an angel of the Lord that night to open the jail. And in verse 20, you can see uh, the angel says, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. These guys were just arrested for that. They were just arrested for doing just that. They were facing probably death for doing just that. So when the, when the jail opened, what did they do? They didn't get out of town like they, they had a chance. Verse 21, so at daybreak, the apostles entered their temple, as they were told, and immediately began teaching. Wow. Their faith is pretty much alive, right? I mean, they were just arrested for doing that, and they were told, go do it again. Keep doing it. 
So the, the high council, um, your Bible might call it the Sanhedrin, they were the full assembly of the elders of Israel, all of the leaders of Israel. They convened, okay, and they directed the apostles to be brought to them for their trial. The charges, well, again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they hated Jesus. They thought that he was a blasphemer. They didn't like the message of the way, and, of course, anybody spreading this message, uh, they just didn't like. But when the temple guards went to retrieve them, they weren't there. My Bible says that they were perplexed. They were confused. Undoubtedly, they were probably pointing fingers, placing blame, probably trying to figure out how they were going to unscrew this situation before the big dog gets in, uh, here, you know, word of this. And so while they're at the jail trying to figure things out, somebody comes and taps them on the shoulder and says, hey, those dudes you just arrested last night, they're over here in the temple preaching right now. So the temple guards and, and the chief priests, they go directly to the uh, temple, and they arrest the, Peter and the apostles without violence, without issues, um, and then had them taken directly to the high council. See, they didn't stop at jail this time. They weren't going to leave anything to chance. They went directly to the high council. If you look at verse 28, it says, we gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. Verse 29. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. We must obey God rather than any human authority. That's pretty active faith, isn't it? I mean, that's faith that's, that's alive. Have you ever been in a situation where you were so sold out for a cause that you just had to stand up and be counted no matter how foolish it seemed, no matter how crazy it was? You just had to be counted among them? Dallas Cowboy fans, anybody Dallas Cowboy fans can testify? <laughs> in his book, Radical, David Platt, talks about a trip that he took to Asia to visit the underground church um, before he became the youngest megachurch pastor ever. Uh, he tells about the different church leaders that would gather to have secret meetings, um, and they would come at different times in the morning just so they wouldn't draw attention to their meeting because, as he writes, they live in a country in Asia where it is illegal for them to gather like this. If caught, they could lose their land, their jobs, their families, or their lives. So Platt goes on, he talks about how he listened to their stories of what God was doing in their churches. And they had a, a church leader acting as a security guard of sorts. So anytime there was a noise outside, a knock at the door, everybody would freeze. They would go silent. And this church leader would go peek and make sure everything was okay and make sure the coast was clear. And then they would continue sharing. Platt talks about the, some of the stories that these leaders would share. Like some, of these, some of their members were kidnapped, tortured, murdered by local cults because of their faith. Other members had been questioned, interrogated by their government, had their livelihoods threatened because they were assumed to have been believers. One of the church leaders says, I need to know how to lead my church to follow Christ even when it costs them everything. And that's active faith. That is, that is faith that is alive. Following Christ even when it will cost you everything. Now, as you can imagine in this meeting, the, what they were sharing, the tears started flowing. They were crying. And one of the leaders says, we need to pray. And so Platt witnessed these leaders get down on their knees and start to pray in, in real prayers, not prayers that, as he writes, are filled with grandiose theological language, but prayers from the heart, prayers of just absolute feeling. They, he witnessed them thank God for loving them and for being with them. They begged God to protect them and, and pleaded with God for, their, for his protection. And then they dedicated their lives to God. They say, Jesus, 
We trust you fully. We trust you fully. But it said these, this prayer went on for about an hour. And then everybody went silent. And slowly they started to stand up. And Platt writes, humbled by what I, what I had just been a part of, I saw puddles of tears in a circle around the room. Puddle, literal puddles of tears in a circle around the room where the church leaders were praying. Their faith is very much alive. In a place where they're going to lose their life if it's known that they're uh, believers. He talks about doctors and teachers and educators that are using their offices, using their practices to spread the good news. They are risking everything. Could you imagine having to, you're a doctor and you're having to see a patient and while you're seeing the patient, you're telling them about Jesus and you don't know that this patient may be a, a government official that could ruin your life. I'm going to read an excerpt here from the book that really just hits me. He tells about teenagers like Shan and Ling who have been sent out from house churches in their villages to undergo intensive study and preparation for taking the gospel in parts of Asia where there are no churches. Ling said to me, I have told my family that I will likely never come back home. I am going to hard places to make the gospel known, and it is possible that I will lose my life in the process. Shan added, but our families understand. Our moms and dads have been in prison for their faith. And they have taught us that Jesus is worthy of all our devotion. Jesus is worthy of all our devotion. Teenagers, teenagers, willingly going, facing at least prison, but probably death, to share the good news. Because Jesus is worthy of all our devotion. Is their faith dead or alive? It's very much alive, right? Even though they could end up dead. That is what I'm talking about when I mean sold out and having faith that is alive. And that is what Peter and the apostles did in front of the high council. You see, when they were confronted by the high councils, by the high council, Peter and apostles said they chose to glorify God and to trust God and lean on their faith. And they said, we must obey God rather than any human authority because Jesus is worthy of all our devotion. So, of course, after hearing this, the high priest, the high council, they were furious. They were super mad. I mean, after all, these dudes defiantly disobeyed their orders again. So, they were sentenced to death. But wait, there's more. There's this member of the high council. He was a Pharisee. He was an expert in religious law and the prophecies. He was actually who Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, studied under. His name was Gamaliel, and I probably butchered that name, but it's okay. He reasoned with the rest of the high council, see, because he was trusted. He was respected because he was an expert. In verse 36, you see, some time ago, there was that fellow Theodos who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed, and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too. And all of his followers were scattered. Verse 38. His colleagues, he advised his colleagues to leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing anything or doing these things merely on their own will, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You will may even be fighting against God. Now, Gamaliel was regarded as an expert in the law and the prophecies and all that. But I have to question, if he was such an expert, if he knew all this, how come he did not recognize Jesus as the very Messiah that the prophecy and the law pointed to? I'm not here to discuss that. Whether he was an expert or not, he was obviously a very good salesman. Because he convinced the others. In verse 40, the others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. 
Now, the Passion Translation says, so they brought the apostles back in and had them severely beaten. The Message Bible says, they called the apostles back in after giving them a thorough whipping. Do you understand the point I'm trying to make? This was not a pleasant experience. They were not just given a slap on the wrist and put in time out. They weren't told to go stand in the corner and think about what they had done. No, they were beaten. They were probably beaten with an implement like a cat of nine tails, which is a handle about yay long, and it's got, you know, how many ever pieces of leather uh, at the end, and on the end of the leather they have rocks or, you know, sharp rocks or bone or, or something that is designed to tear the flesh as it whips. And they probably each received about 39 lashings because the law that they follow limits it to 40. And so that 39 lashings would keep it under the, the legal limit for punishment. Whatever the case, this was not a pleasant experience at all. After being beaten, you read the, the apostles were ordered to never again speak in the name of Jesus. Jesus. And in verse 41, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer grace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message, Jesus is the Messiah. They rejoiced. They were beaten for their faith, and they rejoiced. They celebrated that God found them worthy to be beaten. How many of you would celebrate taking a whipping for Jesus right now? Not only that, they were beaten severely for doing something, and then when they left, they continued doing that something. I mean, that is faith that is so alive. But I am curious. How many of you would stand up and take a beating? How many of you would risk your life right now for Jesus? I mentioned him a few minutes ago, Paul. He gives us lots of examples of what it means to have active faith. The dude wrote 13 we know he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Depending on who you ask and what you believe, maybe 14, depending on who you believe, wrote Hebrews. This is not a discussion for today. He wrote nearly half the New Testament. So we have a lot of examples of all the struggles and trials that he went through. I'm going to use some examples from, from uh, Luke's writing in Acts uh, of what Paul said to demonstrate his faith. And this won't be up there on the screen. It's just, I want you to take a note. Acts 20, verse 22, Paul said, And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. My life is is worth nothing unless I use it to do the work that Jesus called me to do. In chapter 21 of Acts, Luke is telling a story about this guy named Agabus who comes up and he walks up to Paul and he takes Paul's belt off and he binds his own hands with Paul's belt and he says, the man to whom this belt belongs will be bound in this way by the Gentiles and handed over to the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. So in Verse 12 of chapter 21, Luke writes, When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But Paul said, Why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I'm, not only, I'm, not, I'm ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even die for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul's faith was so alive that he was willing to die for the sake of Jesus. As I'm reading this, I'm wondering, what if Paul was just a passive participant in Christianity? What if Paul, when he had his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he said, okay, I'm saved. I'm going to church every Sunday. I'll go on Wednesdays. I might, you know, hang out at the youth group for a little bit or something. But I don't know if I'm going to risk my life for this. What if Paul's faith wasn't alive? Where would we be today? Where would our church be? Something to think about. 
so I want to look deeper into faith as living versus dead faith. I want to take a look into what it means, kind of a compare and contrast, what it means. We've, we've had many examples so far of active faith, living faith, the teenagers in Asia and Paul and the apostles and Peter. Let's look at dead Christianity. But I want you to look at yourself. When we are talking about faith and how active you are, what do you want? What is your desire? Sure, you could say, I want to follow Jesus. But do you really? Do you really? I mean, you could take this book, the Bible. You can commit verses to your memory. You can have it written on your heart. You can, you can study and study and study and study. But then when you walk out of these doors or you close up the Bible for the day, the way you live, you might as well just... That's what you might as well be doing if you are not following this word. So to talk about dead faith, we're going to hear from four people in the New Testament. And if you've ever listened to any sermons about faith, alive and dead, this first one shouldn't be a surprise to you. Faith without works is dead. This is James. James chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. So don't tell me you have faith if the things that you were doing or not doing, whatever the case may be, say otherwise. A few weeks ago, a good friend of mine sent me a meme, a picture, whatever, from Facebook, and it was a quote from somebody that says, sometimes I joke about what I'd do if I had one day left to live, eat junk, go crazy, etc. Today it hit me. Jesus knew, and he washed feet. Jesus knew, and he washed feet. See, he came to serve, not be served. So, how are you serving? Where is your heart in service? The second person we're going to hear from is John. Love without deeds is dead. Faith without works is dead. Love without deeds is dead. 1 John 3, 17 and 18. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how could God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Don't tell me that you love if your actions, your giving, your time say otherwise. Are you greedy with your money, with your time? with your talent, or do you give it freely? Uh, a friend of mine once said that a person with a closed fist, representing greed, can't receive blessing. So don't tell me that you love if what you do and how you uh, give whether it's money, time, whatever, doesn't reflect that. The third person we're going to hear from is Paul, my man Paul. In his letter to the Romans, he tells us that grace without holiness is dead. Faith without works is dead. Love without deeds is dead. Grace without holiness is dead. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. 
Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Don't tell me that you live in and accept God's grace if the way you live does not reflect that. You see, Paul tells us, yes, that we are saved by grace. But if you keep reading in Romans, you see that he says that, yes, we're saved by grace, but this is not a hall pass to keep on sinning. See, you have to pursue holiness. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that we can never reach that standard. But we have to pursue it. Right? Paul writes that um, we will become a slave to whatever we choose to obey. So we're either slaves to sin that leads to death, or we choose to be obedient to the will of the Father, which leads to right, righteous living. So don't tell me that you live in grace if you keep on doing whatever it is that you're a slave to. What sin are you a slave to? The last person we're going to hear from is Jesus. So you have faith without works is dead. Love without deeds is dead. Grace without holiness is dead. Jesus tells us discipleship without obedience is dead. Matthew 7, 21 is recorded. Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Don't tell me that Jesus is your Lord if you are not actively being obedient to his will. Don't tell me that Jesus is your Lord if you are not obediently seeking and following the Father in heaven's will for you. So what is the will of the Father in heaven? Well, each one of us has a different calling on our lives. Some of you have been called to be doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, first responders. That's not me. I'm not smart enough, so thank you for what you do. Some of you have been called to be teachers and educators and, and work in the school systems, and if 2020 taught me anything, that is not my calling. I can assure you of that. Thank you very much. Every teacher and educator, past, present, future in this room, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. So it is up to us individually to seek the Father's will for our lives. But there are three things that we all have to do, that we're all called to do according to his will. First, we must repent. And repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, God, I sinned. I'm sorry. Repentance is turning away completely from your sinful behavior. It is ceasing all sinful things, and it is pursuing to live daily by this. We're not perfect. We're going to fail. We're going to sin. We have to repent from that and go away from that. We have to go away from whatever sin draws us apart from God. Second, we must believe. And yes, it is easy to say, I believe. Sure. I believe what the Bible says. Sure. Thing is, true belief will always, always, always imply and require action. You see, if you say that you believe everything that's in this book, then that means that you believe that we have to turn the other cheek. That means that you believe that we have to always give. You see, you can't say that you believe something if you're not going to follow through with the actions that you say you believe. Third, we have to follow him. And see, this is where it gets tough. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where things get difficult. See, up until now, okay, repentance, okay, I, that was easy to say, but now I've I've really tried to cease my sinful behavior, so I'm repentant. That's, okay, we're there. And belief, and, you know, okay, I'm, I'm actually studying. Now I really understand what this is saying, what this means when I read it. And, and now I know what I have to do. I have to serve and all these things. Um, but following Christ, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it's going to be difficult. You see, following him means that we renounce everything. We renounce everything that is not of him. And we give him everything. You see, it is by him and through him and because of him that we have 
what we have. So we are called to be good stewards of that and give a portion of it back to him. See, when Jesus chose us, we became his. We are not our own. We belong to him. In Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25, he says, Jesus said to the disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Take up your cross and follow me. So a little over five years ago, uh, Kim and I started attending Cornerstone regularly. And we fell in love immediately with the love, acceptance, and forgiveness that this congregation extends to everybody who walks through those doors. It was amazing. We, were, we felt at home our first Sunday here. The other reason we got hooked so quickly was because Pastor Greg, our senior pastor then, he has a passion for the Word. And he delivers sermons that are memorable, that, that will move you in a way that you can understand. And one of those early sermons from when we started, he was preaching about this, about taking up your cross and following him. And some of you that were here, then you will probably remember that he had this big giant cross made out of poster board or paper, something flimsy. And he picked it up and he showed how easy it was to just carry this cross up and down the stage. And it was easy because it had no meaning. You see, that flimsy cross couldn't hold up to the sin of the world. It couldn't hold up to the weight of the sacrifice that was needed for us to be free. And then he had our big cross, which is over in the fellowship hall now, but it was up here on stage. It's the one we've used for the Easter dramas. That thing is heavy. I've picked it up. It, it's heavy. It's heavy for, for a group of men to pick up. And Pastor Greg, Pastor Greg picks it up, and you can see him. He gets it up on his shoulders, and then he's walking a couple of feet. It's tough. And that's to demonstrate, it's a reminder of it's never going to be easy to pick up your cross and follow him because of the, what the cross represents. The cross represents the sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross for us, for, for every one of us. The sins of the world were nailed to that cross. That cross has to be heavy. It has to be big because that cross means that we are free. Following him is never going to be easy. Matthew 7, 14, Jesus says, The gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult. Only few will ever find it. Now, before I go any further, please, the, the, the passages I just read can always be misconstrued or often taken out of context and, 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 and misinterpreted. This is not faith by works sermon. See, we are not saved by what we do. We are saved by what he did. And we are saved by what he did so we can do these things. You see, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have to do these things. When you believe the Bible, you have to do these things. We are not saved because we do them. We do them because we are saved. Paul tells us that in Ephesians 2. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Again, doing these things isn't going to get you to heaven. Having a faith that's alive is not going to necessarily get you to heaven unless you put all of that faith into Jesus. Now, we've all heard of the persecuted church. We've had prayer rallies for the persecuted church. And if you weren't aware before this morning, you are now, that there are people in the world right now today that could die if they proclaim Jesus Christ. There are people in the world right now that are facing the exact same persecution that Peter and the apostles and Paul faced 2,000 years ago. And friends... I believe that that same persecution is headed to America, headed to the Western world. It's on its way, guys. It really is. It only takes a glimpse of the news. Literally any television show, any channel on TV, just glance at it. 
listen to just 30 seconds of any song on secular radio. The enemy is working hard to bring us down. In recent weeks, you've seen celebrities manufacture, market, and sell Satan shoes. Shoes that have a drop of human blood in the soles, that have decorated with a pentagram, that have reference to Luke 10, 18, where Lucifer fell from heaven. And that's celebrated. You've seen sexual perversion celebrated on primetime television. And awarded, You've, if you just listen to 30 seconds of some of these songs, they are disgusting, they are filthy, and they are in the ears of our children every day. The enemy is working hard to destroy us. You see things like the Equality Act try to force organizations like our church here to accept things that go against the very word of God, the very thing that we stand on. You've seen transgender people added to cabinet positions at the federal government, you've seen local pastors support these things. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask somebody around you. I know they can, and if they won't, I'll show you. Local pastors even claiming that maybe God's transgender. What? Are you kidding me? Now, look, don't take this. I don't hate the sinner. See, I hate the sin. I love the sinner, so I pray for them. I pray for each one of these people. And we all have to. You see, we're under attack, and we're under attack from the inside too. And I believe that all of this could actually be leading to a time where our Bible would be considered hate speech. I believe this could be leading to a time where me standing up here right now professing Jesus Christ could get me thrown in jail. I mean, it's happening in Asia right now as we speak. And the enemy is working so hard to bring that here. So when our faith becomes unlawful, when it becomes illegal to gather here as a family in this church, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? This week was spring break for our children. Um, and Monday I took the three children to Duck Donuts in Charlottesville. If you've never been, it's amazing. Um, but on the way over, my 10-year-old, Mason, who's sitting right here in the front row, he said to me, Dad, I know the Bible tells us that Jesus has already won the victory. The victory's already been won. We know that from the Bible. But Satan is working really hard to bring as many people down as he can to tell them. When he said that, I'm like, I gotta write this down for my sermon, buddy. <laughs> So what happens when it becomes illegal? Well, I'm going to tell you like Joshua told us in the Bible. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I hope you'll join me. If you remember the Sermon on the Mount, just keep this in mind. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, among the poor, those who mourn, the humble, the ones that hunger and thirst for justice, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, In Matthew 5.10, Jesus says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You see, persecution is inevitable. We will face it. It's it's coming. We know it's coming. In verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 5, Jesus said, God blesses you you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Persecution's coming. Worship team, if you can make your way back up here. So, if you didn't, couldn't tell already, if you didn't know, Paul is one of the men in the Bible that I really relate to. And his faith is one that I hope to emulate. See, he was the self-proclaimed chief of all sinners, right? He made it his life's mission. When he was known as Saul, it was his life's mission to seek out and destroy and persecute anybody that followed the, the way, that followed Jesus Christ. Crucifixion is what he did. He wanted to wipe Christianity off the face of the planet until he was walking on the road to Damascus and Jesus appeared and said, why do you persecute me? 
and, and Paul was changed. And, and from there, we see for the rest of his life that he dedicated his life to Jesus and to the way. And we see, we read all of his struggles, his trials, his temptations, all of which point to the grace and the love and the mercy of Jesus. In his letter to the Philippians, in verse 21, he says, uh, for me, living means to live for Christ, and dying is even better. In other words, everything I want to do for my life, I want to do for Jesus. Because when I die, I get to be with Jesus. For me, living is Christ, dying is gain. From a dark and damp Roman prison cell, Paul wrote these words to Timothy. And I, I, I take them as a challenge, and I want them to challenge you. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on this day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to, what, to his appearing. I challenge you, whether tomorrow could be the day, 20 years from now, whatever. Is your life, has it been poured out as an offering to Jesus? Has your life been poured out as an offering for God? Have you been faithful? Have you fought the good fight? Have you finished the race? That's the challenge to myself, and that's my challenge to you. When, not if, but when you're persecuted for your faith, rejoice as the apostles did because we know it's coming. And if we're being persecuted, then we're doing something right. See, our faith without action is dead. So we have to have a living faith. Be active in your faith. Stand up to the persecution. And my last question, will you follow Christ even when it costs you everything? Everything. 